Good morning and welcome to this week. Hey, Scott. Hey, Joe. How's it going? I'm good. You're in a purple room. <laughs> yeah, this is my uh, this is my office at home. It's uh, mm -hmm. I didn't choose the wall color. It was like this when I moved in. A little little uh, little grim feel. It feels like a layer. This is definitely a layer of color. Or you could be a, a, a fan of the Minnesota Vikings. Is that still a team, the Minnesota? Still a, still a team, but this is this is more like a, I don't know, a scarlet, right, or a like reddish purple. Aren't they? They're a, like a bright purple. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, we love purple. <laughs> they used to call the Vikings the purple people eaters <laughs> back when I was in high school. Anyway, it's been one hell of a week and good morning revolution, by the way. And also, we need to ask our friends who are watching to hold a watch party. Um, you know, you can share this um, broadcast with your friends, your comrades, your family, you know, uh, people want to know. Uh, they have inquiring minds and uh, we'll be debating some big issues this week. Uh, like the Democratic Party um, a debate the other night. Oh my God, it had the largest viewership. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's the largest view of viewership ever or the largest viewership of the primary season, but it was it was quite big. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna admit, um, you know, uh, that I I did not uh, watch the debate. Um, I meant to, but. Uh, didn't get to it, and I haven't read the transcripts yet. But I've heard, I've heard two different kind of accounts of it. Um, I've heard that it was like uh, everybody attacking everybody, um, just kind of crazy free for all. I've also heard that um, Sanders and Warren uh, were really um, kind of moving together in attacking Bloomberg. Um, did you catch it? Did you, can you tell me which one of those is the more, the more accurate? Well, I would land in the middle. I think it was a little bit of both. And um, but Bloomberg sure did take it on the nose. I mean, he uh, he came under heavy, heavy fire almost from uh, everybody, and rightfully so. I mean, that stop and frisk program was fascism on the streets. We were living in a police state here in New York City. You know, they were throwing black and brown young men up against the wall repeatedly. Some people got stopped 40, 50 times. You know, can you imagine? That's, yeah, that's, it. that's you insane. Know? And, and, and it, it's sort of, we've seen under, under the Trump regime, democracy has become kind of a mass question. What does democracy mean? Uh, what, what does it require of the government, of the people? Um, what, why, the, the fight for democracy has become a mass fight, and I'm not certain that you know a, a billionaire buying his way into the primary, sort of skirting the the usual rules and procedures, you know, necessarily represents that that movement for democracy. I, I well, I mean, on the other hand, there's a broad popular front um, and against fascism. And um, there are be sections. There are going to be sections of the ruling class which are going to join that front. There's no no question about that. And um, that's why they call it a popular front. <laughs> a, well, that's, a front that's of the people. And uh, but the question is, to what degree do they dominate it, and to what degree do working class people uh, lead it? I mean, I think that's a bigger that's a bigger issue. Now, with respect to Mr. Bloomberg, I mean, you know, the dude has taken good positions around um, climate change, for example, and they say that his answer to the, that issue, and uh, he has um, uh, supported other candidates during the uh, primaries in 2018, and and. Uh, played a big role in, in, in the election and, and the defeat of a number of Republicans. Absolutely. And, and, and that's important. But will he dominate? Huh? No, continue. I, I interrupted you. No, I mean, the issue is, will he dominate? What are you looking at over there? You got some... Uh, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but I, so, um, it's a new setup, and I keep 
your voice is coming from a, a speaker over to the side of me, so I keep oh, doing like oh, I should be looking okay. at everything. All right. Right. <laughs> so uh, I mean the the the, the so the um, so so that's going on, and um, but on the other hand, I think that you know the guy he has to do more than apologize. I mean, the question is, how are you going to make amends? How are you going to make reparations? You know, it's not enough. Uh, what is your platform? You know, and uh, more broadly, what will be the platform of of the uh, Democratic Party? Uh, going forward that will address the real issues of, uh, of working class uh, of people. I think that is not that platform important. has to be the fight against against voter suppression as, as a, an absolute core component of this, this struggle for democracy against uh, the fascist danger, against the Trump regime, against the Republican Party. Um, and, you know, I, I would, I would encourage, you know, I, you know, I laud uh, Michael Bloomberg for his pledge to support whoever the, the Democratic nominee is. Um, and I would encourage him to turn his resources to um, the fight against voter suppression and the fight to, to make sure that um, everyone gets to vote and every vote is, is counted. Um, that would be a step. That would be one step. You ruin a lot of people's lives, yeah. you know, uh, in New York ruined, you know, is the damage, you know, black, black and brown youth were criminalized, you know, and it wasn't just the physical act of being thrown up against the wall, it was everything that came with it with regard to uh, police and, and other kinds of suppression, because once you're criminalized, then it has repercussions, you know, throughout uh, society, you know, you're, you're we already had a problem of being followed when you walk into a store. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you're already constantly under suspicion, you see, and it just heightens that that whole uh, problem. And so, uh, and that is really troubling, especially since one of the the core features of of the Trump presidency has been uh, a call for increased uh, violence and increased repression by uh, police and by ICE. So if yeah. Bloomberg can't separate himself clearly and definitively from that, how can he you know, make the case that he is the person to beat Trump? It's a good question, but it looks like Bernie is ahead, man. He's like he's leading the pack by double digits. You know, who, who would have thought? There's a new situation, mm -hmm. a new situation in the country and in the Democratic Party. I saw a poll the other day, um, we said that 52% of Democrats polls that they would enthusiastically support a socialist candidate. That's so huge. And then I was trying to find the link for it and I found another poll, which was done the week before, which was said 74, 75% of Democrats polled said that they would vote for a socialist for president. I mean, the socialist moment, which we talked about several months ago, it's, it's not only does it live, um, not right. only does it live, but it's expanding. And which makes it all the more kind of, it's almost beginning to sound comical because we're still getting in, in some of the, the main uh, uh, corporate media outlets, all of these uh, opinion pieces about, you know, oh, Bernie's far-fetched ideas. Oh, you know, we just have to accept that, you know, a, a, a radical or, or a, a, a left winger is not the one to, to be, but it, it seems increasingly disconnected from the reality of where a lot of the, the base of the Democratic Party is. Um, People are moving to the left. There is an objective radicalization process taking place within the working class, you know, and it was it, it was brought to a new level by the 2008 financial crisis, which was came about as a result of a subprime mortgage ripoff where these banks, you know, knew that they were uh, providing loans to African-Americans and Latinos and senior citizens that they could not possibly pay back. You know, they knew that they had ballooning rates, you know, 
that for one year it would be at 4% and then it would uh, escalate to 12% or some crazy. Yeah, it was, it was 4% long enough for the bank to repackage the mortgage um, as a, you know, investment product and, and sell it off. And then, and, they it, and then they would, they would bet against it. They called that shorting. <laughs> and then there were companies that specialized in insuring um, people against losses on those kinds of bets. And uh, nobody, it was just a whole billions, billions, y'all, and nobody went to jail for. I, I read somewhere that um, that crisis. So working class people tend to accumulate wealth in the form of of home ownership, right? right. Um, and that crisis swept away half of the accumulated wealth of the U.S. working class. And for Black and Latinos, it was the largest wealth loss in history. You know, which is why we have this concept and this deep ideological concept based in political economy that racism is the Achilles heel of capitalism. The Achilles heel. Think about that, you know. And that subprime crisis precipitated a worldwide recession. You know, the, they say that we're in the 11th year of the recovery. But most working class families, black, white, or brown, haven't recovered, you see? And that also has accelerated the radicalization process. You got to work two, three jobs, you know, in well, order to make ask it. something about this radicalization, Joe. I've heard some people um, attribute it to, to Trump, right? Uh, people finally see how bad things can get and they're, they're, they're waking up, you know, they, um, Trump has, really galvanized, you know, a, a movement of resistance. Is that, I have some doubts about that as you could probably tell by my tone, but um, I know, what do, you, what do you think about that idea? Well, I mean, I think that that's partially true. There was, there was outrage, you know, um, outrage by women, you know, at his misogyny, you know, his women hating uh, attitudes, you know, um, and, uh, that uh, contributed to the uh, resistance that, that developed in the immediate aftermath of his uh, election. Uh, but I think that a uh, larger uh, uh, force was the crisis of everyday living and the fact that people just can't make ends meet anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. Students are forced to live at home with their parents. They can't afford to move out because the, they got $75,000, $80,000 debt, and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, and then there's the crisis of police murder in black and brown communities, you know, which has also contributed to the, to the fury, you know. Enough! People are saying enough. And by the way, we got a great editorial on the party website, the title of which is Enough is the party statement on the 2020 elections. And we would encourage everybody to take a look. But you posed a rhetorical question. What's your view about what's causing it? I think when we look at, it's, it's not, I mean, the, the, the outrage is one thing that's, um, that's a, in a certain sense, a, a subjective condition. Yeah. Um, when we think about the, the development of a movement against it and an organized force against it, that, that was in development. The work was being done on that long before Trump was elected, um, you know, since 2000 and even, even before 2008 in some cases, fights um, for, for single payer, for Medicare for all, uh, for a living wage, for, for union rights. These things have been, um, organization has been ramping up around them and this is, uh, an excel a moment of, of acceleration of intensification of amplification um, uh, under Trump, uh, but I, I don't think I think it would be wrong to suggest that sort of people brought themselves together uh, because Trump was elected. I, I well, think. here again, we live in, in my opinion. We have lived in a different political moment, a different like uh, kind of political conjecture, if I can use a you know. Uh, twenty dollar word uh, since the two thousand seven two thousand eight crisis, because you saw with that crisis, you know, uh, the development of a large 
uh, democratic movement uh, that crystallized in the Obama campaign, you know, um, which developed largely independent of Democratic Party structures. It was brought inside the Democratic Party after he was elected, but it kind of emerged, you know, uh, outside of it. That was the first. And then the crisis hit. And then what happened? You had Occupy Wall Street, you know, which was a huge mass movement, you know. Uh, and up until that point, the debate in the country was deficits, deficits, deficits. Yeah. We gotta balance the budget, y'all. Deficits. Yeah. And Occupy hit. And all of a sudden, deficit. 99% versus the 1%. And we're still kind of, you know, in that a, a moment. And mind you, in 2016, there were two mass movements that developed in the country, you know, following the mass movement around. And Obama's election camp was a mass movement. I've never seen anything like I don't think there was anything like it historically. 20, 30,000 people coming out to rallies. And then in 2016, two mass movements, one developing on the right, Trump, you know, the other developing on the left, Bernie Sanders, you know, and, and all of which uh, uh, were, were um, uh, protest against the existing order of things. You so know? And we should think about this you know, this notion of, of crisis and the response to it, because if we look historically, um, the, the, the biggest economic crisis in our history was the Great Depression. Um, and the result of it was, or the, the response to it was a, a democratic response. It was the New yeah. Deal, which emphasized workers' rights. And that was yeah. possible because of a huge, united, um, kind of popular front movement of which the working class was in leadership um, through organized labor, the, the, the new um, industrial unions that were developing. Um, we contrast that with um, the kind of overlapping crises in the, the early 1970s um, uh, around the Vietnam War, but also the, the oil crisis and the ensuing economic uh, slowdown. The response, the, the left, at that point was much more fragmented, um, uh, much less united. This on the right, the new kind of, uh, what would become the, the Reagan right, the extreme right was developing and, and gaining in unity. And the response to no, those started, yes. swung toward neoliberalism, right? So how, how, is, how are we going, what is going to be the response to this ongoing crisis of, of everyday life, which is also tied to the climate crisis is it going to be a democratic response or is it going to be further to the right? That's, well, that's, what's the big, that's the big question. And let's not also forget that part of the response in the working class was a response to NAFTA, you mm -hmm. know, um, and real anger at the export of capital, meaning the export of jobs uh, abroad uh, and, and the inability of people to, you know, make ends meet. Um, and Trump had demagogically, <laughs> extremely demagogically positioned himself as a working class alternative uh, by which he met white working class people. And, and you've written um, about uh, how faithful he's been to his promises to the working, to, the, to white workers and to the exactly. working class more generally. <laughs> exactly. And so now uh, I think that uh, the big question is who will govern uh, next year? Uh, after the November election. Will it be a broad democratic uh, coalition in which working class people are able to exert more of a decisive influence? And it looks like there are two mass movements on the left that have emerged around that. One of them is led by Bernie Sanders, the other by Elizabeth Warren. And then you have the movement on the right coming from uh, a Trump. I think that we need a movement. Uh, it's it, it's going to take a mass movement to defeat Trump. No question about it. And it's going to take the broad left and the broad center. It's going to have to be led by a woman candidate, in my opinion, and a person of color, you know? Without that, I think, you know, we're going to be in big, big uh, trouble. But it looks like, and I'm very hopeful that 
that that kind of combination is going to come together. And when it does, I'm going to tell you something. It's going to be unstoppable. It's going to be unstoppable. Watch. I just hope that people draw the correct lessons. Well, we've been going for about 20 minutes. We have a uh, podcast, uh, I'm sorry, a webinar on Sunday night. You want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. Um, uh, we'll be uh, joined by Dr. Michael Honey, uh, who will talk about his book, uh, To the Promised Land, uh, Martin Luther King and the Fight for Economic Justice. Mm. Um, it's, uh, I think it's going to be a great talk. If you haven't registered yet, please do attend if you can. But even if you can't attend uh, Sunday night online, um, you'll still get a recording of it to enjoy at your leisure. We also have another webinar coming up March 8th. Um, International Publishers is uh, re-releasing, um, republishing Elizabeth Gurley Flynn's uh, Account of Her Time as a Political Prisoner under the Smith Act uh, with a new introduction. Um, and Dr. Mary Ann Trashati will be uh, presenting um, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. Uh, and I think it's, it's also going to be great. And there's uh, registration info for that. I believe up on our Facebook page. And on Sunday, we want you to help us break the internet. We have 264 people who have signed up. We want to get up to 300 this time. That'll be an increase of a third over what we've been doing in the past. We need 44 more people to do it. You can sign up. It's at the top of our Facebook page. Click on the link, sign up. And as Scott said, even if you can't make it on Sunday, you will be sent the webinar to look at at your leisure. Well, uh, have a great weekend. Um, I think on the 23rd is the, the W.E.B. Du Bois's birthday. So happy birthday, uh, W.E.B. I think today is also the uh, day uh, of the Saturday. I think it's the 53rd um, day uh, commemorating the uh, death of, uh, of Malcolm X. Uh, we have a great tradition of struggle in our movement uh, amongst our people. And building on that tradition, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Ida Wells, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, um, Mother Bloor, you know, that's what's going to take us into the future. We're standing on the shoulders of giants, Scott. Yep. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. I'll take be, care. Uh, huh? hey, Joe. I was like, I'll, I'll be in New Haven, Connecticut this weekend for the, um, uh, the People's World um, Black History Month uh, celebration, which is going to focus on uh, voting rights. Uh, so I'll hope to have uh, a little bit of uh, video and maybe a Looking forward to hearing about it next Friday. Take care. Take Bye -bye. care.